Well, good morning. This is an exciting day. Exciting day for a lot of reasons. It was a year ago this week that my health kind of failed, and I didn't know if I was going to be able to speak the gospel to the world again. I was in a bad situation, but so many of you prayed, and the Lord doesn't waste any time, and He doesn't waste any pain. And so I'm getting well. Thank you so much for being a part of my life. Well, we're going to study the Bible. And so I hope you're ready for that. There's a lot of fun happening today, but I'm asking you guys to focus your attention on some stuff that we're going to learn from the Bible, from the Lord. That's really good. So let's stand up one more time, and I'm going to pray, and we're going to pray. You guys pray with me, okay? You guys ask the Lord to open our minds to understand what he has to say to us today. Lord Jesus, thank you for what you've done in this world and what you've done in our hearts and what you're doing this morning in this church. And Lord, we just want to give you more. We want you to reign supreme in our lives. Thank you for what you're doing, what you teach us right now through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, if this is your first time to grace, you probably showed up and thought, oh my goodness, maybe this is like a, a leftover version of Halloween with all these people dressed up. It's not. And if you look around the world, you see the same kind of thing. And you might kind of think, the same thing. Like, what's going on? Why is there all this diversity? Why are these all, all these kinds of people? Why are there all these languages? Is this just coincidence? Or is God doing something? Does God have purpose in this? And you're going to be excited how this fits into the epic drama that God is writing in our history. It's exciting. And so to understand this, to understand what God is doing, what the purpose of all this diversity is, we want to go back to the beginning to get a little bit of history, okay? So think back to the Garden of Eden. God creates humanity. He creates Adam and Eve. And if you remember, the garden then encompassed the whole world. In fact, you almost get the idea if you read through there carefully that the garden is under God's plan, but something going on outside that might be a little bit weird. And in fact, humanity's assignment is to subdue the earth and to take control. And so you kind of scratch your head in that, and then you get to chapter three, and you realize, yeah, that's right. There's entities, or at least an entity, on this planet other than just the people in God. So what is going on? In fact, that entity turns out to be the, the devil, and he gets the humans, the two humans, to turn against God too. And the result is that somehow it's, it looks like he, that the devil receives some kind of ownership or authority or title deed or something to this planet. And not only that, but the humans get ousted from the garden, and they go from bad to worse, if you didn't notice. God destroys them in a flood, saves eight people. Those eight people, their descendants, they go back to the same muck. Until finally, even the humans realize, hey, we, we, better, we better get some control here. We better get some organization. Because if we're not careful, we're going to destroy ourselves. So by chapter 11 of Genesis, they kind of get in a huddle and they say, okay, guys, we got to come together in unity. And so we're going to read about that. Let's read about it, guys. Genesis 11, 4, this is what they say. They say, come, let us build ourselves a city, more than just the structure of the city, but the organization of a city and a tower that reaches to the heavens so that, underline that so that in your Bibles, so that we may make a name for ourselves and not be scattered over the face of the whole earth. So what's their motivation? Think about what their motivation is in this. Their motivation is strength and security through unity. You guys see that? The Lord knows that you can't get any unity apart from him. Look at verse 5. The Lord came down to see the city and the tower that the men were building. And the Lord said, if as one people speaking the same language, 
they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan will be impossible for them. They said, if these people are able to achieve this kind of unity, they're going to think that they're invincible. And that would be a lie. So in love for these people, I'm going to thwart their plans. Now look what he says in verse 7. Come on, let's go down and confuse their language so they will not understand each other. And so the Lord scattered them from there over all the earth, and they stopped building the city. And you think, is that all the information you're going to give us? There's got to be a whole story in that that we don't get here. In fact, there's some confusing words in here. But those confusing words might give us a little bit of a hint as to what's really going on. So look at verse 7. The Lord says, come, let us go down. Who is he speaking to? Who is he speaking to? And there's lots of opinions about this, but there are some other scriptures that we can go to that might help us understand what's going on here. So let's look at another scripture that is just a couple of verses that talk about what happened here in this division of mankind. And that's in Deuteronomy 32, verse 8. This is who knows how much later Moses is speaking after the children of Israel have been in bondage in Egypt. And now he's explaining to them in Deuteronomy their history. But this is what he says in regards to what happened back there in the division of mankind. You guys interested? Yeah. Some of you said, yeah. Okay, guys, this is, this is study time, okay? So you got to pay, pay attention. Deuteronomy 32.8 is what Moses explains. When the Most High, who's the Most High? God. Most of you got that right, too. Now, why is he called the Most High? In comparison to all these other gods that the nations worship, he's so much higher than all of them. So when that God, the top God, when he assigned the nations, who are the nations? We, that's right. Okay, and it can be a little bit confusing, but this, this is a word that the that Hebrews used primarily for everybody but them. It basically means foreigners, non-Jewish people. So when the Most High assigned the, the non-Jewish people of the world their inheritance, inheritance isn't just grandpa's watch that you inherited when he died. Inheritance speaks of land areas. You guys with me? So when the Most High assigned the non-Jewish people groups of the world their property, when he divided up the sons of man, the descendants of Adam, when he decided divided up the sons of man, he set the boundaries of those geographic locations according to the number of the sons of God. And I want you to see the, the contrast between that term, sons of man, and what he says, the sons of God. You guys see that? So you think, well, you guys know what the sons of man are. I mean, he's talking about the descendants of Adam, humans. But the sons of God, who are they? Well, if, you've, if you study through the Old Testament, you find that the sons of God is a, a term that is used to refer to those entities or those personalities that were created by direct creation of God rather than biological reproduction. So the only person in the Old Testament that the Bible calls a son of God other than prophetic reference to Jesus, the only person that's called that is Adam. And the reason he, Adam is called that is because he wasn't created through biological reproduction. So he's called the son of God. You guys got this? Yeah. Okay. So who are these sons of God other than Adam? And we find out as we study the Bible, which I hope you guys do. 
hope you're spurred on to study through this, that those sons of God are what the New Testament refers to as angels and demons and principalities and powers, the powers of this of the dark world, the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. You guys with me in that? That's what this is referring to. So these are fallen angels. And yet, the Lord makes a comparison in verse 9 of Deuteronomy 32. He says, those descendants, those, those non-Jewish descendants of Adam were, were parceled out to land areas that were under the claim of fallen angels who still said in their development against God, this is my spot. And he sends these non-Jewish people out to all these places. But, verse 9, verse 9, he says, but the Lord's possession is his people, Jacob, or Israel, his allotted inheritance. In other words, all those other people got sent out into these areas that were claimed by false gods. But he chooses one little group of people, and he chooses a land area smack in the middle of Europe, Asia, and Africa. And he says, this place is mine, and I get this little group of people for myself. Why would God do that? I mean, you're thinking, oh my goodness, why, why does God do the things he does? Well, sometimes we know and sometimes we don't. But we're told in Acts, when Paul shows up at Athens, he explains some of this. Acts 17.26 tells us about this. So Acts 17.26, we're told, Paul's, Paul's preaching to non-believers, and he says, and he made from one man, he's speaking of God, made from one man, Adam, every nation of mankind to live on the earth, face the earth, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries, the land areas of their habitation. He's talking about this dividing up of the sons of man. Are you guys still with me? I got two yeses. Come on, guys. You guys with me? Please stay with me. Okay. And then in verse 20, you're just, you're just speechless because you're excited, I know. Okay. Then he tells us in verse 27 why he does it. Verse 27 tells us why he does it that way. That they would seek God if perhaps they might grope for him and find him. In other words, what we find out, what Paul's saying is the reason God does it this way and splits up all these people is because he wants all of them to look for him and to find him. Oh, he takes this group that he reserves for himself and doesn't reserve them, the Jews, simply for himself because he thinks they're all that great. In fact, he tells them later, you're not, you guys are just the same as everybody else. But he takes them and he works with them for the next couple thousand years, loving them, working with them, training them, guiding them, disciplining them. And how do they respond? They don't respond very well, right? They don't respond well at all. In fact, they seem to resent him. They seem to resent him. And they seem also to resent all those other people groups. They seem to look down with scorn on those people groups. So when they build the temple, when God has them build a temple, they add an extra wall outside the temple that foreigners can't get in. If you guys want to worship our God, go ahead, but you do it from outs in the parking lot. That was their attitude. In fact, they, they put sign is there in front of the temple around in that, that wall, this dividing wall, that warned any foreigner that went, that went inside that they would promptly be executed. You want to see one of those signs? Go ahead and put the sign up here. This has been dug up by some archaeologists. And this is, actually, there's quite a few of these, if you, of these warning signs. They were all around the temple. Can somebody read that for us? Okay, let me tell you what it says. Foreigners must not enter inside the dividing wall 
or into the forecourt around the sanctuary. Whoever is caught will have himself to blame for his ensuing death. Not very nice, is it? So, where does that place me and you? Unless you're Jewish, unless you're part of that little tribe that God had chosen for himself, you are stuck out there in the parking lot, and you can't get close to him. But God wasn't satisfied to let that be the final story. He's got something bigger in mind. He's got a bigger plan. And he tells us about it in Ephesians 1, 9 and 10. Guys, this is a verse worth pondering. Understanding what God is doing in this history and what he still wants to do as we work for, move forward into the future. So Ephesians 1, 9 and 10, Paul's writing to the church in Ephesus, and he says, and he, speaking of God, made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure. He's saying, that mystery, that thing that we, we didn't understand why God did it that way. That's been revealed to us. And then skip into verse 10, go over to verse 10. It tells us what it is. This amazing, overarching plan of God to bring, look at this, second half of the verse, to bring unity to all things in heaven and earth under Christ. What's God's plan in all of these things that he's doing? His, his goal is to take all those people, all this world, heaven and earth, creation, as it says in Romans 8, that creation longs in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. He's looking, there, the creation is waiting for this unity between heaven and earth. That's what God's up to. And then if you flip to the next page, if you've got your Bibles and you're looking at Ephesians 1 and 9, you look at the next page, and in Ephesians 2, chapter or verse 11, he explains a little more of how it's going to happen. Verse 11 of chapter 2, he reminds them. He reminds us. Therefore, remember that you, the Gentiles in the flesh, who are called the uncircumcision, so I'm jump forward to verse 12. Remember that you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the co covenants of promise, having no hope without God in this world. That's where we were. That's where everybody was except the Jewish people. Then verse 13, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were formerly far off, that was us out in the parking lot, worshiping from afar, not able to get to God. You who are far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Amen. He paid for it. For he himself is our peace who made both groups. Who are the groups? The Jews and everybody else. Both groups into one. And he broke down that dividing wall. He broke down the dividing wall. That wall that was keeping us out. He obliterated it when he died. Let's skip down to verse 17. And he came and preached peace to all you who are far, far away. And peace to those who are near. Speaking of the Jewish people. For through him, we both, Jews, Gentiles, and everybody else, have our access in one spirit to the Father. So then, check this out, verse 19. So then, each of you is no longer a stranger or an alien, but you are fellow citizens with the saints, speaking of the Jews, fellow citizens with the Jews, and you're a part of God's family. That's, yes, thank you, Jesus. And therefore, because that's now the case, there is no more division between Jew and Gentile, no division between rich and poor, no division between slave and free, no division between 
men and women, no division between black and white, no division between Mexican, Hungarian, Japanese, Philippine, or whatever else you are. We are one in Christ. Now, let me ask you this. Think. Does that mean that when we come to Christ, that we need to change our culture and become Jewish culturally? No. It doesn't. You don't have, you don't have to become culturally different when you come to Christ any more than you have to have to change your identity or your personality or your accent. You are unique. Your culture is unique. And God is honored in this diversity. He's honored in the diversity of our ethnicities, our languages, our cultures, and our personalities. We are one in Christ. Now, when it comes to position or privilege, those differences don't make any difference. Those don't make any difference because Jesus made us one. And all the barriers have been washed away by his blood. And any person or school or government or law or anything else that works against that principle is working for the devil's plan for humanity. I want you guys to understand my heart. I hate discrimination. I hate racism. I hate it, and this church hates it. And we hate it because Jesus hates it. Because racism at its core is from the pit of hell. And we're going to spend the rest of our lives working together to destroy the devil's lies. We're going to work together to put Jesus in the center with us and of us and to celebrate him in 10,000 different languages and with 10,000 different cultures for eternity. That's our plan. The question is, will you join us? That's a real question. The world, the people of the world are going to spend their futures arguing about critical race theory and about discrimination and about gender equality and about border control. And I just want to say, although some of those things matter, the answers to those questions might matter, but don't spend, don't waste too much of your time arguing with people about those things. Because your arguments don't make all that much difference, if you haven't noticed. Instead, the way that we change the world is by loving the people who are sitting next to us on the bus, or at school, or in our workplace, or on our street. We love them regardless of whether they agree with you or not. Unity. Guys, this is the problem. The world doesn't understand what unity is. Lots of talk about it. Unity isn't that I get all of you to agree with me. And the proof is I probably already said something today that you disagree with. That's not the end of the world. We are united in Christ. Okay? I mean, you, you guys look at the world through the scope of Jesus. Jesus is the one that breaks down all differences in our culture, in our language, in our skin color. And we accept each other as brothers and sisters in Christ because we have a common bloodline, the blood of Jesus that paid for our sins. Amen. That's what matters. Amen. And we're going to celebrate him. Today we're not just celebrating a bunch of cool dress-ups. Dress we're not just celebrating a bunch of ethnic food. What we're celebrating is what Jesus did to unite heaven and earth to unite all cultures, to unite all languages. Let's do that today. Let's do it today. Let's do it tomorrow. Let's do it every day for the rest of our lives. Let's do it in this church. Let's do it on our streets. Let's do it in our schools. Let's do it in our attitudes. And let's do it across the parking lot right after one more song. Amen.